Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jesus. I'm so glad it's Christmas. All the tins lights the problem is right all about you happy birthday jesus i'm so, I'm so glad it's christmas all the bells and the holiday swell Christmas morning. Did you know that? The most important, of course, is from the Bible. Amen? And uh, I love the first part of this verse. For, verse it's like this It's like this. Uh, this cold front. How many of y'all noticed we had a cold front the last few days? And how many of you noticed that the water pressure dropped drastically the last few days? If you're in, in our area, it happens, doesn't it? Well, look at the first five words here. And it came to pass. Aren't you glad? It's supposed to warm up today and more tomorrow and the next day. So when you're going through a tough time, then you can take this verse of Scripture, it came to pass. So it's going away. Thank, thank you. Right? And, and, and so that's a word of encouragement. But it also came to pass that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus 
that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. And so they all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to be to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Lord, it's a day well worth recognizing through history, Lord. Uh, in fact, we set our, our calendars by it every year. Lord, uh, the, the B.C. And, and the A.D., Lord, that we put behind the dates, Father, even though they seek to change them, it still centers on the time when you stepped in in the flesh to deal with our issues, our sin. Thank you so much for doing that. So, Lord, here's a birthday where we get the presence. Father, and I pray that we recognize, Lord, your presence with us today. You said you'd never leave us or forsake us. What a present. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We've heard this story many times. I notice the older I get, the more times I hear it because it's an important story. But do you know how many people don't know this story? Do you know how many people are out there? I was reading statistics. Uh, it says 81% of the people in the United States uh, identify as Christians. Which may sound good, except that's the lowest it's ever been. And when you get down to how many people attend church, there's been about a 45% drop since COVID started in churches and you can pretty much see that reflected here it happens that way and that's not guilt trips or anything else it's just recognition of where we are as a culture and the, the people who are the furthest away from identifying with church or whatever are, are young people and, and people who believe in liberal causes that's the statistics that's not a that's not a throwing out there but that's the ones that show up that way well what are the most popular causes these days if you look at tv or the newspaper. I guess if you still get a newspaper, but but the online news or whatever. What are the most popular causes? How many see it as the Christian cause? Uh, is are we more concerned about salvation for eternity, or if a pet's cold outside? Because you get all kind of, of uh, religious sounding songs around the commercial about a poor puppy that's out there in the in the weather. And you keep wondering why the cameraman don't go pick that puppy up and, and get it back in the house. You know, it, it's strange what we put our, our focus on these days. We've forgotten. We've forgotten that a nativity scene is more than a decoration for your front yard. Would you agree? It's more than a cute baby. And sometimes we leave Jesus as a baby. <laughs> so much more. He's God incarnate. God who came in the flesh to rescue us. And why did he dress it up these ways? The time of Caesar Augustus, we, we learned last week, uh, Herod was, was king. Now remember, there was the Roman Empire led by Caesar Augustus who appointed this guy Herod, who wasn't even Jewish, over the Jews because he was from that area. They thought he would be more popular. And he was a horrible guy. He tried to have all the little ones killed later, if you remember, to keep from losing his throne. We, we, we talked about that, right? But did you know that death and taxes still took place back then? And this is a scene about, about taxes. Can the government even use taxes? I mean, not the government. Can God, God even use uh, taxes? He sure can. He did here, didn't He? He showed one miracle where they needed to pay the tax, and where did He get it? Guys, we like this one. Where did He have to go to get it? Yeah, I mean, when it's almost time to turn in your tax stuff, tell your wives, hey, i got to go pay these taxes. I'm going to go check a bunch of fish's mouth and see if I can find some more money like Jesus did. It probably won't fly. <laughs> but anyway, he, he even used it for what? For an excuse to go fishing. <laughs> Actually, he sent somebody if you think about it. But taxes. You know why? Taxes are temporary. Did you know that? Earthly government, you know, the man-made government is temporary. All because the King of kings and Lord of lords chose to come down from heaven. Remember, he thought not equality with God, something worth grasping or hanging on to, or robbery if you read it in the King James. But he came down for who? For you and I. You talk about a gift wrapping, a manger, a stable, right? All the stars. One in particular, if you ask the wise men. All this, this gift wrapping that they came with him. And so it said, the first census was taken by Quirinius, who was governing Syria. Now, if you go look and do the research, you find out, well, wait a minute, he wasn't governor until about five years after the year zero. And Jesus was born about five years before the year zero. 
So it couldn't be this. Well, that's because we, we it's amazing what we use to negate Scripture. Uh, people who are in the government aren't necessarily the governors, but they can govern certain areas. And that's pretty much how it's been explained. He was in the uh, bureaucracy of the time. And Herod didn't want to do a tax collection because he was already fairly unpopular. If you want to get more unpopular, what do you do? I'm in charge of taxing this week. <laughs> would you be invited to all the Christmas dinners today? Would, wouldn't happen that way, would it? And so, however it worked out, we know that all Scripture is God-breathed. I trust God's Word more than I do uh, secular institutions that haven't quite figured out how that works together yet. Okay, so when you hear that, remember all of the Bible and how it comes true. So you don't have to be doubtful of a one little spot again. Secular history chooses to use to try to disprove the Bible, because if the Bible were to disprove and man seems to be really intent at it, then we would have to throw the thing away, and we would have amazing promises, like He would never leave or forsake you once you've accepted Jesus. We, we couldn't believe that if you confess with your mouth, He's your Lord, and you believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You couldn't believe that anymore. Amen? So which part of God's Word do I believe? Every bit of it. Are they things that I don't understand? Yes. Yes. Guess what? I have faith for those too. Why? Because He's never lied to me yet. Why would He start? How many of y'all have friends that are 99% truthful? But because of that one time they told you that fish was this big instead of this big, they can't be your friend anymore. Our friends aren't perfect, are they? And yet we still love them. Let me tell you, you've got a God who is perfect. Amen? And if you could trust Him for everything else, you can trust Him for those that the world may say, well, we don't know about this. Because God knows about this. And I know the God that knows about this, and I trust Him more than I do me. And especially the lost world who looks for other things to worship. Other truths, little t, to hold. I believe in the way, the truth, capital T, and the life, don't you? His name is Jesus. Joseph went up from Galilee out to the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. Well, that was important because the Bible tells us that way back, way back, we knew that Jesus would come from this lineage. It was promised to David. It would be the lion from the tribe of Judah, an ancestor of David, the root of Jesse, which was uh, Jesse is David's father. It would come on down this, this lineage. We call it the seed line. It's the seed that was promised, the seed of the woman, the virgin who would, would the, the, seed, uh, the child of the virgin that would come later. And through this seed line, all the way from Eve, all the way to Jesus. And so, uh, Joseph is from the house. And you say, well, wait a minute. Joseph isn't the biological father of Jesus. Amen. How many of y'all agree with that? Amen. He's not the bi biological father of Jesus. He's an amazing stepfather, though. If you're from a blended family and you say, oh, that's, that's, a, uh, that's not the best family to be from. I don't know. Jesus was from a blended family, wasn't he? Had several kids, right? Jesus had several stepbrothers and sisters and all that stuff. And it worked out pretty good. Do you agree? It worked out really, really amazing when you think of it. Okay? So he went there to be married with, with excuse me, to be registered with Mary. They're betrothed, but they're not married yet. They're betrothed, but not married yet. Uh, it's really interesting. The word for virgin in the, in the Hebrew, back in Isaiah, when the virgin will have a child, and, and he'll be called Emmanuel. Y'all may remember that verse. But that word could be used for young woman, which was supposed to be synonymous with virgin, but wasn't necessarily, who would have a child. And so he said, by the time that child uh, is up and, and, and weaned, basically, eating curds and this and other kind of thing, that uh, the, the armies that were oppressing Israel would be gone. But there wasn't a virgin birth in the time of Isaiah. How many virgin births do we have in history? Just one. But it did point to what? In, in this place, we, we read it this morning. In this place, the, the, the Greek word that the New Testament was written in, the word for virgin can only be used for the term virgin. Someone who is like Mary, who's never been with a, a man, a, a human, right, before. And so it's really important, because so, she's to be registered 
his betrothed wife. They're not married, but she's waiting for a child. I, I love the, one of the Christmas shows of, of, of Mary and Joseph, and it shows them leaving Nazareth. And as they're leaving Nazareth, they've become really looked down upon because she's well along with child. And, and uh, she's riding the donkey and Joseph is leading her and the people are kind of turning their backs on them because they got such shame in this young girl who's supposed to be a virgin. And, you know, worldly speaking, obviously she's not, according to them, right? And so as they leave child and nobody's talking to them, one of them says to the other, they're going to miss us. <laughs> a little humor in the spot because they knew the whole truth. The whole truth is God is doing something amazing and, and us humans don't understand it. We follow our own what? They would tell you, we're following the science. Mary, you're not a virgin. <laughs> it becomes ridiculous when you realize God was up to something and He'd been talking about it for thousands of years, what He was going to do. So when they say follow the science, I'm going to follow God's Word. Right? Science won't get me to heaven. Will it get you to heaven? Now, if science is done correctly, I have no problem with it. They're seeking to find out what God's done. And they investigate and they come up with all kinds of things. So I have no problem with science done correctly. I have a problem with science where you're called an ugly name if you don't believe the science that they believe that day that's changed from maybe the month before. How many of y'all remember when global warming, warming was a problem? Do y'all remember that? Y'all remember? None of y'all remember that? Well, it was global warming until what happened? The, the science didn't match up. It, 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 the temperatures went the wrong way and all that kind of stuff. So now it's no longer global warming. What's it called? Climate change. We fixed that. So that's the problem. Because in Louisiana, everybody knows that the temperature stays the same year round, right? The average is 72. How often is it 72 in Louisiana? Once. <laughs> you got to catch it going from what? 40 degrees to 102. Somewhere in between. Really quick. So they, they made the science where it has to line up because weather changes and things like that. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't all be very responsible for the environment God's given us. I'm not speaking against that. I'm just talking about what will we do not to listen to the truth that God has for us. We will conjure up all kinds of things. And what happens? Less people, especially young and people who fall for that most often, will turn away from God. And they'll find little things in the Bible that they haven't, don't have the full picture of. It's amazing how for how long they say, well, the Bible uh, it isn't relevant anymore. It's been changed so many times. And then God let a goat herder throw a rock in a cave and what, and near the Dead Sea. And what, what did they find in there? Ancient manuscripts. And guess how much the Bible had changed? Zero. Any discrepancies they found have nothing to do with salvation. And there usually were human error. Somebody repeated a word twice or left a word out when they were copying. But nothing to do with salvation. So, you know, you can trust the Word of God if you can trust God. Amen? They go together. Alright? So they're, they're there to be registered. And so it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Why do we think that Jesus and Mary are poor? You must be poor if you have to have your baby in the stall. It doesn't say they were poor and couldn't afford a room. It says what? There weren't any rooms available. Have you ever left Louisiana during a hurricane and tried to find a room within 300 miles? No matter how much money you got, guess what? It's not available sometimes. It depends on the storm, right? But, but that's the kind of things that happen. But there is reason to believe that, that, what? that they didn't have a lot of money. Because if you had a lot of money and, and you made this, the uh, sacrifice at the time to, to God at the time, you had a chance to give a larger animal or a bird. And guess what they gave? The birds, right? They were much cheaper to, to do. So that tells you they were poor. They were poor until how long? Till they needed the money. What did they need the money for? We studied this last week. When the wise men came, they brought them what? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Suddenly they had a lot of money. And God says, it's time to travel. And they took a trip to Egypt. Do you remember that? All those things happen. So when will God give a Christian what they need? When they need it. Right? Or when it needs to be. When it, God has a tool, a, a particular mission for them to go on. 
Okay? So that's that's what happened to get to that point. Y'all know the backstory, but I'm, I'm going to repeat it anyway. I'm going to give you a little background for it really quickly. It says here, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth. Okay? It says the six months because a little earlier in that same chapter, it's talking about when this guy Zacharias was in, in, uh, as a priest was in, in the temple in his shift and his time to be there and, and the angel of the Lord came and told him, your wife's going to have a baby. And he was kind of like, Mary, well how's that going to happen? <laughs> right? She's old and, and she's barren and her womb's not alive anymore. It, her womb is dead. And he says, it's going to happen. He says, well, since you're not going to believe me, you're going to lose your voice. And sure enough, he was in there a long time. He came out he couldn't talk to the people. And they asked, what's going on? Right? And he made the signs that something was happening. Anyway, it's now six months later. Six months from that time. So Elizabeth, with a dead womb that wasn't working anymore... It's having a child. You mean you can get life from death when you're dealing with God? Absolutely we can. We can, but God can. Amen? I was dead until I met Jesus. I was dead in my sins until I met Jesus. When I say met Him, not know about Him, but I chose to do what it said in Romans 10. I, and and I, I made Him the Lord, the leader of my life. I do believe He's the Jesus of the Bible who was born of a virgin and, and what? Raised from the dead after they killed Him, actually after He was executed. For crimes. The amazing thing, it wasn't even his crimes. Whose were they? Mine. He paid my debt. So I believe in that Jesus. And he says, you shall be saved according to that. So from death to life. If you say, well, I've never seen anybody raised from the dead. If you've seen one person except Jesus Christ, you've seen God raise somebody from the dead. By dead, we mean condemned to eternity without God. And there's only one place for that. And we, we know about that anyway. So all of this happened. So, Gabriel came to the city in Galilee, Gabriel's the angel, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. That fulfills prophecy. That's, that's the direction that uh, God's going to use to bring God in flesh to man. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come, and the, and the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And we said in the Sunday school lesson this morning, How rejoiced would you feel if God says, Comes to your door today, knocks on your door and says, I have a big mission for you. I've picked you out of everybody. How many of y'all are really happy and overjoyed to hear that? Was Job overjoyed to know what he was going to go through as he did the big mission for God? We get a little nervous, don't we? What's that going to mean, God? You mean I have to change? You mean I can't stay where I feel safe and, and secure and all those other kind of things? It's kind of hard to stay where you are. I'm not just talking about geographically, but where you are and go with God, isn't it? Do we got to get closer to God by staying where we're at? And I don't mean geographically. I don't mean this spot. I mean mentally, emotionally, and possibly geographically, wherever God would have us to go. Those kind of things happen. So here she is. He says rejoice. And she's saying, basically, what's that old thing in the show? What you talking about, Willis? Was, was the old, old line. I'm, I'm a little nervous about this, right? He says, but when she saw him, she was troubled at the say and the manner of greeting that it was. She was afraid. So the angel said what most angels say when they meet man. Don't be afraid. Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call this name Jesus. And he will be called, he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Mary, knowing the history of the Jewish people, and, and they were well versed, that they really discipled their kids from day one. God had all the festivals where they would go and attend. You're kind of at a festival now, aren't you? We get to attend and remember what God has done. And that's what the festivals were done for then. We, we celebrate Easter, right? But it's really Passover for the Jewish people. And it's a festival for the time God delivered them from earthly issues. Amen? And they have other festivals to remember God. And, and so she knows about what's going on. And she knows that the one who's going to have the eternal 
throne of David is the Messiah that's been promised. So now she knows where she's at. She knows what child this is. You ought to write a song about that. What child is this? And we know it's this one, right? Okay. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. How long? Forever. The king of the Jews. Remember how nervous we studied Herod God last week? Got last week when we talked about the wise men come and says, where's the king of the Jews? And Herod's saying, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> he says, Baby, you're not the one we're looking for. They had to follow a star to find that one. He wasn't the one in the palace. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I do not know a man. She says, basically I'm a virgin. I'm true to, to my vows, to my betrothed. How can this happen? She's not being unfaithful. She's wondering... How will this take place? And we know that by what she says later. And what, what does the angel tell her? It's going to be a miracle, Mary. <laughs> Look how he says it. A miracle is what? The supernatural affecting the natural. Amen? That's a miracle. She said, The angel answered and, and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One... I love that they capitalize that. The Holy One. Who is that? That's what child this is. That's Jesus. The Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he tells her, by the way, your barren cousin, Elizabeth, she's pregnant. She's six months alone. Well, that's impossible. Except with God. Because what's possible with God? Right? All things are possible. Except we said this, God can't sin. That's not possible. God can't lie. That's not possible. You can count on God. Right? That, that's, that's what takes place. And I love what Mary said then. Behold the maid servant of the Lord. She just said, I'm your servant. And as we shared this morning in Sunday school, what she said was the answer is yes, I'm your servant. You tell me what the question is. When she said, behold the maid servant of the Lord. That's what she was saying. Boy, do I want to grow up and be like this possibly 15 year old young lady who was scared and in a bind and yet she says I trust God more than my fear more than the traditions more than the understandings and the false understandings people have around me what do you call that when you trust God more than the earthly things it's called faith without faith it's impossible to please God and we're saved by grace through faith and not of works but she showed her faith by her what? Trusting God over the other things that are out there. Well, she went and, and she found her cousin. And, and she knocked on the doors because she went all the way from Galilee down to uh, the area around Jerusalem. And when she got to the house and entered the, the house of Zacharias and she greeted her cousin Elizabeth. And it happened that Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So what's the, the first other human being that recognized who Jesus is in, in the Bible? Who is it? John. But where is he? In the womb. You mean there was some sort of consciousness in the, in the womb? You mean this wasn't just a mass of sails stuck together? No. Recognized. Amen? Recognized from the womb. How important is that child in the womb? We find John the Baptist, our introduction to him, uh, of his first thing that, that he did in, in, in human form, what was there, was he? He, they say it twice, in fact. Verse 44, For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. The babe leaped in my womb for joy. Well, I told you that during this time, guess who can't talk? John's dad. He can't talk because of what? His question wasn't how to. His question was of disbelief. And so he wasn't able to, to talk until something amazing happened. The wife said when the baby was born, his name will be John. And they said, you don't have any relatives named John. That's crazy. You're not going along with human convention and all that kind of stuff. And so Zechariah wrote, his name is John. And at that moment, he was able to speak. That's kind of important that he was able to speak. 
Because it said, it, it, he gave a little sermon. A little sermon, not like mine. I mean, it's really kind of short, so I'm, I'm going to share it with you. Okay? And he said, Now that his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. What's he saying? God is here, and he's going to be here while he's visiting. Right? In the flesh, God's going to be visiting. And what's he going to do? Buy his people back from their kidnapper. That's what redeemed means. And kidnappers don't generally have your best interest at heart, do they? So he's delivering his people from danger. But it's going to cost something. Redeem means paying it. Okay? And has raised up a horn of salvation. Horn in, in the Old Testament means the power. The power to save. Okay? A horn of, uh, of salvation for us. In the house of his servant David. Again, fulfilling the prophecies. It's going to come from the line of David. And he spoke by the... As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, from Genesis on, it's been prophesied, this child, we know which one it is now, right? This child is coming, the seed of the woman, the one who's going to be called Emmanuel. On and on and on he's done that. Through the Psalms he talks about this child that's coming. So he said, here they are, since the prophets have been telling about it. This didn't just happen all of a sudden, an afterthought of God, it was settled before the foundation of the earth. That we should be saved from our enemy and from the hand of all who hates us. Are the Jewish people known as popular people around the world? You don't generally hear anti-Icelanders. Uh, uh, How many times do you hear people, oh, I'm just anti-every Icelander that's out there? Have you ever even heard that? I hadn't either. I just kind of followed it up. Right? I was trying to think of one I haven't heard. I've heard a lot of other anti-stuff. But how many of you have heard of anti-Semitism? It's been popular for a while. Did you know it's gaining popularity again? But it says right here, what's going to happen with the Jewish people? Jewish people. They're going to be saved from the hand of all who hate them. And you go read Revelation. He absolutely will. It's going to be done. He said it. It is. To perform the mercy, uh, the mercy promised to our fathers and remember His holy covenant, the oath which He swore to our father Abraham. We're studying that now in Genesis. We just talked about a time when He took an, an oath he made a blood covenant, and usually in a blood covenant, two people go down and they say, if, if I don't keep mine share, then you get to kill me. And they walk between two dead animals, or several animals, two pieces of animals, and when they get down there, having walked through that bloody mess, they, they know that they've taken an oath. They know that it's done. But when God did that with Abraham, He left Abraham on the side and He walked down it by Himself. He took the blood oath Himself. Does God have to take an oath? Will He ever lie? But Abraham wanted to said, how am I going to know you're going to keep it? And so he showed the whole ritual and he didn't let Abraham take part. In other words, Abraham was going to be saved by grace, not by what? Works. It won't be you keeping this oath. It's me keeping this oath for you. How many of us know that Jesus keeps his oath for us? Does it mean we can go sin? Well, if you want to, but guess what? If you're his, what would he do? He'll chastise you. <laughs> because He loves you too much than to say, yeah, go for a wasteful life that hurts people around you. Go for less than the best. He's not going to do that. Because He said, you're illegitimate if I don't. But who makes sure that you're saved once you've made Him the Lord of your life? He does. He takes that oath. So we've got that, that same look here. It's the oath, like the one He swore to Abraham. By the way, how was Abraham saved? By works? No, his faith was counted unto him as to righteousness, right? We get that way back from the Old Testament, way back from Genesis. To grant to us that we, being delivered from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without what? Without fear. They say, well, wait a minute. He promised peace on earth and there hasn't been peace on earth. How many of y'all have noticed there's not peace on earth in that way? But let me ask you something, Christians. Do we shake in our boots at the thought of God? Or do we come to worship Him and get to call Him Abba? Not formal, Father, don't hit me. <laughs> but what? Daddy. I'm in need. I'm scared. I'm this. I'm that. And we can go to Him boldly to His throne because of what Jesus did. We have peace between us and God because of what Jesus did. That's peace on earth. God has goodwill towards man. 
Isn't that neat? He has good will. He's got your best in mind. In holiness and righteousness before Him all the days of our life. Never leave us or forsake us. And then He says this to His Son. John. Just named Him. He says this. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. To give knowledge of salvation to His people. John, you're called to go and tell the people that God has said, I want you to be mine. He says, you get to go tell them how. Through the tender mercy of our God, which is the day spring on high from which He's visited us. He's talking about Jesus coming. To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. There to, he's to go and tell people how to be saved. Who to look to. Right? That's his job. So the child grew and became strong and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to, to Israel, till his ministry began. Okay? I'm going to share one more thing and then we're going to close. One more topic. When he was born and he was there, For it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room at the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of God shone greatly around them, and they were greatly what? Afraid. Like Mary was. <laughs> Right? Like Zacharias was when the angels came. And the angel said to him, what angels say when they meet people, what's the first thing they say? It's either don't be afraid or get up. <laughs> don't kneel down before me. It's one of those two things, right? That's what we find them in the Bible saying. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. That's one who saves us from what? If, if somebody finds you floating in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you hadn't seen anybody in two days, and they say, I'm going to be your Savior and help you out of that water, and you say, nah, I've got other things to do. I've really gotten comfortable here. Is that what you would say? How appreciative would you be? A couple of shark fins go by you every now and then. Right? The scary thing about us in this world is we don't recognize the sharks anymore. Amen? We don't recognize the dangers. It's really scary. But he says a Savior is coming. And who is he? He's Christ the Lord. That's what child this is. We're still answering that question. And this will be the sign for you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. Now what does that look like? You go in the, the stable and you look to the corner and there's a, a, a trough used for uh, feeding livestock. And in there, there's a baby wrapped up with, with tights so he, he, doesn't, uh, uh, he feels secure and other kind of things that they have. There's lots of other stories about that. I'm going to tell you, I, I, you have to be careful because there's so much mythology written around Christmas. Have you all noticed that? I, I, I've only killed a few deer, but not one's had a red nose yet. You know? Uh, and on and on and on and on and on the mythology. And we even get into religious mythology. I, I want to be careful before I speak it from the pulpit. So there's some stories you can talk about those things. And they may or may not be true. I just don't have any verification. Right? And I want it to be verified before I say, Thus saith the Lord. So I love to read out of God's Word because I know that's verified. God has put His stamp of approval on it. He said, Don't add to it, don't take away from it. Amen? So it, it says, Lying in the major. And suddenly there was an angel... Uh, with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, that's more angels, uh, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards man. That's what John announced, right? That's what God delivered to us. And so it was when the angels had gone away into the heavens, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Did they say, I don't know, I'm comfortable here around the fire, and somebody's got to watch the sheep, and we better not go there. We'll let somebody else do it. What would they have missed out on? God's best. What happens when we say no to God? What do we miss out on? Christians, if you're saved, what do you miss out on when God says, Let's go do this? 
And we say no. God's best. Amen? Eternal rewards. All kind of things that we do. Be, be very careful that we're not misled. But they went. And what did they find? They went with haste. They didn't say, I'm kind of worried about this. I hope God's not setting us up for a fall. I hope He didn't take us out of Egypt into the desert just so we could uh, drown or, or what? Die of starvation or no water. That's what they said when they left Egypt, wasn't it? They didn't say that. They went with haste. And what did they find? Exactly what God said they would. Because God can't what? He can't lie. He can't sin. They found Mary and Joseph in the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen Him, when they had seen Him, they made widely known this saying which told them concerning the child. And all who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. Shepherds weren't generally known as, as guys that you wanted to have over very often. Uh, you might miss a chicken or something because they just came around in a circuit every now and then. But Mary pondered all these things in her heart. I love that. I, I, I pictured Dr. Luke, the writer, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sitting at Mary's feet and saying, tell me what happened that night. And, and her telling me, you should, have, you should have seen it. It was amazing. And these shepherds showed up. You should have seen the joy on their face when they came. And she just, she, you know, for all the tough times we went through, she just pondered those in her heart. She didn't turn loose to that. And I'm going to advise you, when you have a moment with God, don't turn it loose. Hang on to it. Don't let the distractions take away or rob you of the joy of knowing you've had an experience with God like that. And she didn't do it, right? Last verse. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. What did we find out? An angel brought the message to who? To Mary. And first, to, to, to uh, Zacharias too, right? Brought, brought the message there. He brought the message. Okay? And then when, when John's born, we find out his purpose is to do what? Go tell people who Jesus is and how to be saved. Go tell them. What you've seen, right? So, it happens. And it happens in a strange, wonderful way. A manger where more people could come, where normal people could go. Not just the elites, right? But anybody could get there. And then, what do the shepherds do afterwards? They go and do what? They made it known. Glorifying God with their lives now. They're not the same anymore. So, here it is. You've heard the story before. What are we called to do? Well, what was the one before he was born called to do? Go tell people. And what were the ones after he was born told to do? Go tell people. What are we called to do? Go tell people. With joy. Listen, whatever God takes you through, you don't have to worry about it because it has to go through the filter of love. I'm not going to tell you it's always going to be comfortable. I'm just going to tell you it's always going to be the best if God told you to. Don't miss those adventures. Amen. With that said, Merry Christmas. In times like these, we need that message, don't we? And if you've already received that message, you've already received the Holy Spirit when you're saved, amen? Then there's people around you that desperately need it. Desperately. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.